There are over 35,000 museums within the United States, welcoming over 850 million visitors each year. Did you ever wonder what goes on behind the scenes in museums, creating the displays and exhibits we all enjoy? Join us as we explore museums and their exhibits from the inside out. Hi, I'm Leslie Mueller. Welcome to Museum Access, the show that takes you behind the scenes at America's top museums. Today we're on the Mystic River in Mystic, Connecticut, in a New England coastal village, part of the Mystic Seaport Museum, America's leading maritime museum. This historic village includes dozens of real New England buildings from the 1800s that were relocated here in Mystic. Today we'll learn about this important maritime museum and its crown jewel, the Charles W. Morgan, a National Historic Landmark vessel and the last of America's whaling fleet. Then we'll take a behind the scenes look at the museum's shipyard where the Charles Morgan and many other historic vessels have been restored by skilled craftsmen. So are you ready to bring America's seafaring past to life? Let's go. So Steve, here we are on this gorgeous 19-acre campus. Tell, tell me, what all can someone see when they come here to Mystic? Well, Mystic Seaport Museum, uh, since 1929, has been home of, of America's maritime history. So from the shipyard to our exhibition spaces, you can virtually see and experience every element of our maritime heritage. Now, you talk about the exhibition spaces, and I know there are several of them. Are they changing exhibitions, or are some of them permanent? We have seven uh, formal galleries, in addition to all the outdoor experiences. Mm -hmm. The seven galleries are places where we have exhibitions that come from our own collections, as well as changing exhibitions that come from other institutions around the world. I passed a collections building on my way in. It was huge. You must have collections of what? Scrimshaw? I mean, everything, right? We have over two million objects in our oh, collection, ranging from scrimshaw, photography, painting, ship models. It runs the gamut of maritime heritage, including 520 watercraft. Oh my goodness, really? Yeah, we do. And well, we have 40 or so watercraft in the water, four of which are National Historic Landmark vessels. And on three of them, our, our, our guests can get on them and really experience these historic vessels in a way that you just normally can't do. Did I read that 20, over 20 million visitors have walked the decks of the Charles W. Morgan? Yes, 20 million and counting. She's a, a remarkable vessel. Uh, 1841 from, from New Bedford. Uh, she's been with us since 1941. Oh, well, tell me a little bit about that whaling life. I mean, what would happen when somebody got on one of these ships? Were they gone for months, years? In the early years, particularly, they were gone for years at a time. Uh, the first voyage for the Charles W. Morgan was three and a half years long. So they would leave from New Bedford, they'd sail to the Pacific, and then all the way back. That changed in the late 1800s when the railroad was complete across America and the, and the whaling ships would just go to and from from San Francisco and didn't have to come all the way back uh, around Cape Horn. So how many men would be on a ship, I'm assuming men, uh, would be on a ship Pre Predominantly when it men, predominantly mm -hmm. men, uh, 35 or so, uh, mainly because there were five whale boats. Uh, and those whale boats is what the mothership would, would launch, so to speak, and there'd be there'd be six in each of the whale boats. So tell me about the village itself. I noticed that there were coopers and uh, churches, yeah. obviously, a bank even. So you'd mentioned the indoor exhibitions. The, the, the village here, the waterfront village, is, is a chance for us to provide the public with an understanding of the maritime trades that goes into our American maritime uh, history, history. Over, over the 19th century and 20th century. So here you can learn uh, how barrels are made. You can, you can stop by the shipsmith and, and understand how the iron work goes into supporting vessels like the Charles W. Morgan, or you can stop by the print shop 
and, and see how printing uh, has evolved over time. It's a wonderful village and I know we're going to get a chance to see your shipyard where there's some restoration going on, right? There is. Uh, in, in the mid-70s, Mystic Seaport uh, built the preservation shipyard. It's the largest preservation shipyard in America so that we can, we can restore vessels like our Charles W. Morgan uh, but currently we're restoring the Mayflower II for Plymouth Plantation. One of the things that distinguishes Mystic Seaport Museum from so many other places is that you can take your family out on the water. You can go on one of our captain vessels like the Sabino, or if you have some experience, you can go and take your family out in a rowboat, in a small sailboat, and enjoy the Mystic River. And isn't there continuing education? What kind of programs are there here other than just coming with your class? We do, we have actually a residential uh, undergraduate program with Williams College. Uh, 20 to 24 undergraduates live here for a full semester uh, in an interdisciplinary curriculum studying maritime science, history, literature, and policy. It's a one of a kind. What an experience. Yeah. So Sam, I know we're in your domain now, the Cooperage. This is this is such a cool space. Don't you love the, I, working I here? Do. I yeah. do. It's a perfect shop. Yeah, it is. And I know today you're going to explain a little bit about what goes on in here, starting with what, buckets? Yeah. Is it... Now, what, what we'll start with is a tree. OK. That's oh, that's true. <laughs> Forgot we're about gonna that. We're going to cut it down and then cut it into blocks and split it. And I'm going to split it until I wind up with a stick like this. And does it matter what kind of wood it is? What kind it of wood is this? Matter. Oh, it does? <laughs> it depends. The different kinds of wood on different for different con contents. OK. So this is red oak. Red oak wouldn't work for uh, carrying liquids because it's too porous. I see. And so white oak is the one that we generally use for liquids. I have split this up. I left it outside to season for a year, which uh, the rule of thumb is a year per inch of thickness. Uh, and now I've brought it in and I've started carving them. And this bunch here, I've put the arc of the outside of the container. Uh, and then I'm gonna now hollow out the inside. And I'm gonna do that with this draw knife, which this Whoa. is a knife unique to the cooperage. The straight knife, this, is, this knife everybody would have. It's as common as a hammer. So uh, what I gotta do Whoa. here, is uh, carve out the uh, inside arc until I get it following the outside at a thickness that I want. And you're just, because your eye, you know how deep to go? They have to be pretty yes. similar, yeah. Yeah, the, thi the thing is, you're either born with the eyes and hands to do this or you're not. Yeah. And if you're yeah. not, you gotta find something else. Yeah, yeah. You're that's in one it. of the other shops here. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Because everybody got something. So I got the arc on this. Uh, oh, yeah. That that's, uh, follows the arc of the outside at a thickness that I want it to be. Okay. And so I need to do all of these like that on the inside, and then I have to deal with the edges. And so everything uh, that uh, I make is described with three measurements, a diameter at the narrow point, a diameter at the wide point, and a length of the stave. And so having the diameter, I know the circumference, so I can make a hoop that's the size that it has to be. I and see. then I gotta fill it up with the staves that I've made. So I always make a few extra, so at the end I can have, uh, I can fit them in without having to fool around. Like but this is very labor intensive. I mean, it takes a while to make one of these, I would assume. Well, uh, for a knucklehead, it takes a long yeah. time. <laughs> they <laughs> wouldn't hire me for this. Back, back yeah. in the day, it would, uh, a good cooper could make um, a couple of beer barrels in a day. Wow. Um, yeah, which is amazing to me to think, because I was a carpenter, and so I always dealt with wood. Um, and the idea that you could make two of them is amazing. Well, and the fact that you're using older tools, I mean, obviously that tool is unique to this, but That's where do you even that, find no, the no, tools? No. Here's, here's yeah. the deal. I don't have any going Yeah, I know, on That's what I mean, yeah. I have the, it just, it sounds so nice. Um, when, I'm, when I'm doing this, the sound. Oh yeah. I like that sound. Yeah. Music to like your ears, movement. right? Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and so I, I, I love, 
working with the old tools. Mm -hmm. My kids say, I finally found the right gener uh, century to live in. And people would be telling you what size barrels they wanted? Yep. There or were, there was it more the content? Yeah. Yeah. No, there were standards, like a whiskey barrel, which yeah, is so a 42-gallon you know. barrel, and I know what the dimensions are. But those three dimensions describe everything. If it's a bucket, the narrow is at the bottom and the wide is at the top as opposed to a barrel, the wine oh, yeah. is in the middle. But mm -hmm. I mean, it still works. It's still those numbers. Well, I'll tell you, it, it's such a treat to see how this is done. <laughs> and, and I know you've got, you've got fans waiting because the, the line is long to come inside and watch what you do. So thanks, Sam, I appreciate oh, it. My pleasure, Leslie. <laughs>
and presented to the American people as a gift for our collaboration during the Second World War. Oh, and nice. uh, so it's a, a really meaningful project in that regard. It belongs to uh, a sister not-for-profit organization called Plymouth Plantation in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And it's the only ship they own. So they maintain the vessel, but they don't have the facility for this kind of work. And now that the vessel is more than 60 years old, it's time for her to have major restoration. And we look at the ship as historic in its own right, because at 60 years old, it certainly would qualify uh, under parameters of the National Park Service as a historic object. But uh, more importantly uh, is the recognition of the collaboration of the two peoples during the war and uh, the fact that it is a significant vessel in terms of our, our history. So uh, it's great that we have this partnership with Plymouth. Uh, it began uh, probably as early as 2011 in planning and then uh, she came in uh, this November of uh, 2016 to begin what is estimated to be a 36 month restoration project. So right now we've got about 30 full-time people on the project, uh, literally tens of thousands of board feet of all kinds of species of wood, uh, live oak, white oak, yellow pine. Uh, and was all... that all available in England when it was built? Well, no, when she, was, she was originally closest? built, she was mostly English brown oak, but they did import some uh, Douglas fir from the west coast of the United States uh, oh, because of Douglas fir for topside planking is a, a, a good material. Preferred. So. Uh, Again, they couldn't gather enough materials in the UK at that time. But uh, today, uh, we've got a great cadre of people on the project, uh, young people who have just come out of uh, boat building schools, and then we've got some senior folks that have been around doing this for the last 40 years or so. So uh, one generation passing on the knowledge of big timber work to the next. And when it comes to the hand tools that our craftsmen use, many of these tools are antiques in themselves. Uh, there's nothing like better than going around to a flea market on a Saturday morning oh, and finding that. an <laughs> antique as or a big yeah. uh, chisel you have or something to fight like that. People off oh yeah, those are the first yeah. ones that go. I noticed. So uh, again, it, it's many of the tools are uh, much like would have been used in the original construction of this vessel or one of our other one of our other historic ships. So let's talk about salt damage versus freshwater damage. Okay, well, is there more damage one way or the other? Well, it depends on what aspect of the vessel you're talking about. Uh, in terms of the wood, uh, fresh water causes wood to rot, yeah, and salt water will actually preserve it. How does it preserve it? Well, it's just like salting meat or salting uh, fish. Uh, oh. As a preservative, uh, the salt is the same thing for the wood. It just discourage, discourages microbial growth. But at the same time, uh, it can salt water can be damaging to the fastenings. Oh, if a sure, vessel is metal. fastened with right. bronze, it's bronze is pretty uh, immune to damage from salt water. But uh, in the case of this piece right in front of us here, yeah, what is you see this? That, this is a steel fastening. This is a frame from the Mayflower. And this is a steel fastening that you can see through salt corrosion has just blown apart. Oh, God, and wow. the uh, release of the chemicals in the decaying process have caused the wood to decay. Yeah, so, but look at how old this is. Well, well it's 60 years old. Yeah, it's yeah. 19, 19, it's original uh, construction as is this frame. So this is the kind of work we're doing is replacing the frames and then the planking on top of one. So this is a very active shipyard and there's no rest for the weary. Right? Oh, absolutely. And that's the way we like it. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>
crown jewel Charles Morgan behind us. Yes. Tell me a little bit about her. How'd she get here? Sure, so this is the last wooden uh, whale ship anywhere in the world and still afloat. She started off her life in New Bedford. Um, she whaled for 80 years beginning wow. in 1841 all the way through 1921. Wow. And then she starred in a couple of movies. Um, so really? she looks like a Hollywood starlet, yeah, that's, that's why. that's why. Right. And, Does she have an attitude? <laughs> no, yeah. she's very down to earth. Yeah. And then um, she uh, fell into a little bit of disrepair and so a wealthy enthusiast in New Bedford kind of took her under his wing along oh. with our um, James Driggs shipsmith shop and had both of those on his estate where he let people come and go to the beach and see the ship. Oh, nice. And then after he passed away, he didn't make any provisions for her. So after several years of New Bedford not being able to raise enough money to restore her, uh, she came here and we've often called her a lucky ship because she whaled for so long and because and she, she got survived found by a you. lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> but she also got here the very day before Pearl Harbor in 1941. Oh and so if it had been a day later uh, because the happened? military was yeah. involved, she, we wouldn't have gotten her. So that oh was a lucky break for us. So they towed her here. They towed her here. But yep. she's floating now. I mean, has she ever been able to go out? Yep. Again? So she wasn't always floating. She was actually buried in sand for the first part of her life here. And we actually have a lot of visitors who come by and say, is this ship floating? I don't remember that she was floating. In the 1970s, they did a restoration then and floated her. And then we did a major restoration over about five years that ended in 2014. And we kind of celebrated the end of that by sailing her around a bunch of New England ports, which we called the 38th voyage because she had 37 commercial voyages during her 80 years. Well, that must have been quite a restoration to get her to that point. Absolutely. Yeah. It was, was it kind of like, hey, deal. we've got her floating. Let's let's do it. Yeah. So it's very fun. exciting. Yeah. Well, so tell me about what would life be like on a ship? Somebody signs up for an, a whaling expedition, I guess. Well, a whaling they voyage. Sure. A whaling voyage. Yep. And how long and, would they be gone? Right? Well, some people really didn't know what they were getting into. And I frequently <laughs> say whaling. Just sign here. <laughs> whaling was uh, a job that involved long periods of boredom punctuated by sheer terror. Oh. So you were either doing kind of nothing, sailing around looking for whales, um, and then when you sighted whales, you would have this flurry of activity where small boats would be launched down, they would go after the whale. With their the, harpoons, With their I harpoons, guess, yeah. right, bring them back to the ship and process them. And that whole process could take maybe two or three days of really intense labor, and then you might have several months before you sighted a whale again. So, so it becomes a factory too, absolutely. I guess, because when they're bringing it in, they're having to process what the blubber, the oil, whatever. Uh, yeah, blubber turns into All oil of the once above. it's rendered. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And so when they would go to these ports, could they do repairs, get food? I mean, they were sure. going all over the world, right? They were. The so they, the, the longest uh, voyage was actually 11 years, um, oh but most gosh. voyages averaged about three to five years. And Still. that would be away from their home port, not away from any port, of course, because you can't carry that much food and water. So yeah. they would put into ports in the Azores, maybe along the coast of North Africa, certainly off the coast of Peru. Um, and they were whaling all the way up to the Arctic in the Pacific Ocean. And Philippines and all mm, that area Sandwich too. Islands, yep. And would the same crew stay on the ship the entire time? <laughs> Usually. Until they got to the Philippines. So sometimes they when they got to Hawaii, they might jump or ship. Hawaii. <laughs> but, uh, but they would, uh, usually once you signed on, you stayed on board for the whole time because you didn't get paid until the end of the voyage. Oh, that was smart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's the way to do it. And I know that, I mean, this, this whole working waterfront is hands-on. Yes. But you can actually go on this ship. Correct? Oh, absolutely. Not only can you go on the ship, but if you can see behind us, we have some sail set. We actually can sometimes let visitors participate in that. We like to use it as a way to demonstrate all of the nuances of life as a mariner in the 19th century. So mm -hmm. they weren't just whalers, they also were sailors and they also handled cargo. And this gives us the means to interpret all of that. Now I know uh, you have something in store where we're going to be hoisting up one of the whaling boats up the side of the ship. Uh, when they had to bring the whale boat back on board after they were finished um, catching the whales, they uh, didn't bring the whales on board. Yeah, I was at least say. you don't have to carry. <laughs> at least you don't, don't have to haul that up. But uh, but the boats weigh about a ton when they're fully laden, and um, so they would employ as much of the crew as they could. And they had about 30 to 36 men on board who would um, be involved in hauling up that whale boat. Um, we would use a tool called a sea shanty, to, uh, which is music. Most people have heard okay. of sea shanties, yeah, but yeah. its actual purpose was to help with jobs that were really hard work. You could do them with a smaller crew if you coordinated it with music. So um, you said it would be 36. Are there 34 strong men that are going to be helping you and I do sure. this? Yeah, good. of course. Okay, we'll, we'll find them Strong right men now. and women. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, 
line like this, and you'll all go John Francois. And you pull on Swap. Bony was a warrior. A warrior, a terrier. John Francois. I'm not sure I would have had the stamina or the stomach to sail the open seas for a living, but I certainly appreciate that our forefathers did. We owe a lot to the wood carvers, sailors, riggers, and craftspeople from the small coastal villages of our past. They tell America's maritime story and how it shaped our lives today. Thanks for joining us on Museum Access, where every visit is an adventure. I'm Leslie Mueller. See you next time.